So we're jumping back into the series we've started uh, back at the end of February. We're struggling getting going because of the special holidays and different things happening on, but we've started a series entitled Getting to Know the Third Person of the Godhead back at the end of February. We started out by understanding who the most, um, I would say, misunderstood person of the Godhead is, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the Third person, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. But God the Spirit is clouded in mystery. We don't have a shape to give him all outside of seeing him descend upon Jesus like a dove. We don't have a voice outside of hearing Elijah talk about the still small voice of God. And we don't have a lot else to go on by means of biblical stories for our minds to grab. And so we kind of see him as this mysterious figure that comes and goes and we don't know what he does and where he goes and how he acts. So we're trying to give you uh, and all of us a better grasp biblically of who he is, because that's all we can go on. Be careful to take somebody's book and run with it. If it's not based on Bible, it's just somebody's opinion. And we're going to base everything on the scripture, but we did learn immediately that he is the invisible hand of God doing the incredible work of God, and we saw that in the creation account and elsewhere. We also noted that he is the untouchable presence of God, providing the undeniable existence of God. He he can be heard, he can be felt, but he can't be seen. He, he's like the wind. We know he's here, we know God's here because of his presence, but we can't necessarily touch and grasp that presence. And he is thirdly the indescribable extension of God, sharing the incomprehensible person of God. He is just as much of God as is the Father and the Son, and that makes him incomprehensible, it makes him indescribable, it makes him, frankly, incredible. And before Palm Sunday, we looked at uh, how to receive him. We're trying to understand him, but most importantly, we're trying to receive him. We, we learned through the scriptures that we have the opportunity, everybody, every boy, girl, man, and woman has the opportunity to receive the third person of the Godhead within us, inside of our being for our entire life, and uh, we do that by faith in Jesus Christ. So if you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, you may know about him, you may even believe that he came, you may even believe that he died for your sins, but if you haven't personally accepted Christ, received him as your Savior, embraced him and called upon him to save you from your sin, then you haven't yet received the Holy Spirit of God. And so if you want what we're talking about over these next few weeks, if you want to experience the totality of God in your life, you need to receive Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God comes by the Son of God, and so you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. And today we're going to talk about what I, what I believe is arguably the most important biblical principle for Christians in all of Scripture. It's hard for me to say that because there are so many things in the Bible, so many principles that are important, but I, I believe this to be arguably the most important. We're going to talk about walking in the Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll say this by means of introduction and just as a foundation, Christians struggle with this part just as much as unbelievers struggle with salvation. The reason Christians struggle with walking in the Spirit just as much as believers struggle believing in Christ is because we have a hard time not accepting the fact that it's not our doing. Unbelievers don't accept Christ because they have a hard time accepting the idea that it's not their works of righteousness that get them into heaven. That's hard for people. And Christians have a hard time equally embracing this fact that Christianity is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us doing the things we're supposed to do. It's about God working in us and God working through us. And that's also difficult to grasp because we're constantly told to be this way and do that. And so we, we naturally feel like it's our responsibility to do that and be this when it's actually not. We just have a hard time grasping it. Let's get right into it, though. Galatians chapter 5. Paul is writing to the early church in Galatia which is at this point part of the Roman Empire. It's in uh, Asia, which is now Turkey, as far as the geographical location. And before I read verse 1, just know that these early Galatians, who undoubtedly would have had Jewish members of their church as well as Gentile members of the church, primarily Gentile, most likely, but they, they were doing good. They were sincerely Christian. They, they had... Uh, 
forsaken Judaism if they were Jewish, forsaken idolatry if they were Gentile, they embraced Jesus Christ, but somebody at some point came into their church or got on YouTube back then and said something to somebody in that church that gave them the impression they, they had to do some things in addition to believing in Christ. Essentially, they, they embraced the teaching that they couldn't be Christians unless they were both believers in Jesus but also obedient to the law. And it seems like circumcision had a part in this whole context. So somebody must have come and said, hey, uh, in the law, you've got to be circumcised if you're a male. If you're not circumcised, you're not getting the covenant, you're not a Christian. And so there was this, this hesitancy to move forward purely and solely on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Which is why in verse 1, Paul says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm going to help get you through this passage, understanding all of it so you know the context, even though we're not going to read the whole chapter by any means. But Paul's saying to these early Christians, hey, somebody's told you something that's not true. Don't go back to the law, that yoke of bondage. Don't do that. Christ hath made us free. We don't have to do that anymore. For centuries, the Jewish people were under bondage. They had to do what the law said to do. They couldn't deviate from that. And God did that to teach the world through the Jewish people that nobody can keep the entire law for an entire lifetime. That was the whole purpose. It was a schoolmaster. It was to tell the world, hey, I gave the Jewish people this law for centuries, and nobody could keep it for an entire lifetime. You need help. That's what God was telling the world through the Jewish people. And when Jesus came, he was the only one to fulfill the law because he kept it for an entire lifetime. So he said, look at me. I'll keep it for a whole lifetime. You can't do it. I'll do it. And that makes me qualified to die for you because I'm the only sinless person. It was a beautiful picture that God gave the world. Verse number seven. Ye, Galatians, Christians, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? You'll notice the wording. The first verse was stand. Verse 7, run. He's giving, giving us a, an image of what it means to be spiritually sound. Ye did run well. What happened? Why are you hesitant now? Why are you a little skeptical that only your faith will save you? Why are you a little fearful that you miss something, that you have to do something else? Verse number 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. You're not bound by anything. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He's reminding them. You, you guys have to go back to Jesus. Jesus said nothing about keeping the law. He said, I, Jesus, am going to make you free by my death, burial, and resurrection. So then he says at the end of verse 13, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Again, get the language. I know I'm taking my time and you're, it's annoying to pick your head up and put it back down, but get the language. He says you're free. You don't have to serve the law. If you're going to serve anybody, serve each other and do it by love. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He's saying you guys are worried about the law. You don't have to. Christ has made you free. Just in your liberty, don't, don't be a pain in the rear end of each other. Don't be difficult. In fact, serve each other by love. In fact, if you do that, you'll fulfill the whole law. The whole law basically wanted you to love each other. If you love each other, you won't steal from each other. If you love each other, you won't lie to each other. You're fulfilling the commandments. If you love each other, you won't commit adultery. You're fulfilling the commandments. If you love each other, you won't kill anyone. You won't covet anything. If you love each other, you'll do the law anyway. So just love each other. You see where he's going with this? Verse 15. But... If ye bite and devour one another with your liberty, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. 
The language is really, really interesting. Again, if you're looking at it through the context in which Paul is writing, he says, you guys aren't in danger of hell. Christ has saved you. He's freed you from the law of sin and death. He's given you eternal life. You have the liberty to do as you wish. You're free. Just don't bite and devour one another. If you bite and devour one another, you're going to be consumed of each other. Well, that's a picture of hell. If you read the Bible, the picture of hell is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's awesome. He's saying, listen, listen, you have nothing to worry about when it comes to hell, but if you want to use your liberty and be a pain to each other and bite and devour, it's going to be like hell on earth. You don't have to worry about going to hell. Jesus saved you, but church is going to be like living hell. If you're just not loving each other, you're going to be biting and devouring each other. It's fascinating. Verse 16, in light of all that, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Remember, he started by saying, stand. He said, you did run. Now I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out, ladies and gentlemen. He's talking to the Galatians. He says, walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't be biting and devouring one another. The appetite you have for people, and they're, I'm going to tell him, I can't wait to get to church and tell him what I really think. That appetite to bite and devour, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't do that. And if you take the Bible for what it is, absolute truth from God himself, you are given a promise in verse number 16 that you cannot deny. It gives you absolute certainty that if you walk in the Spirit, you will not sin, period. I know that doesn't sound that exciting to you, but it should be. The key to resisting and denying sin 100% of the time is not in your strength to say no, in your strength to say no, in self-control. It's walking in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What Paul is doing, and he's trying so hard through the words of this epistle to help these first century Christians figure out their new Christianity. He is trying to get them from going back to the Old Testament. He says, no, 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 don't go back to the Old Testament. You've been made free. You don't have to do all that. But at the same time, he doesn't want them to go so far this way that they become carnal, so full of the flesh that they bite and devour one another. So he's saying, oh, no, no, don't go back to the old man. Don't go back to the old nature. Don't go back to the Old Testament, to the Old Covenant. Just right here in the middle, walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't have to do the law because you'll fulfill the law. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't bite and devour one another. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. This is where it's at, right here. That's the key to everything Christian. It's amazing. It's game-changing if we get it. The key to keeping us from going back to the do's and don'ts of the Old Testament while keeping us from going back to the do-do's, I call it, of the, new, of the old man, is simply to walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is a 100% guarantee from breaking any godly law. It's a 100% guarantee that if you walk in the Spirit, you will not commit any carnal sin. If you walk in the Spirit, you have no law to worry about anywhere, anyhow. If you walk in the Spirit, you will have no moral failure and no sinful act. And if this is true, which of course it is, then it makes sense for me to call this the most important biblical principle for Christians. Because we don't have to worry about how to do that or how to avoid that. If we walk in the Spirit, well, that solves the, both problems. And yet, most Christians woke up today not thinking a bit about walking in the Spirit. Right? Right? Did any of you wake up this morning and say, Lord, help me to walk in the Spirit? I'm sure you prayed things that would go along that lines, but very few of any of us woke up today, I'm going to walk in the Spirit today. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it. It's my fault for not preaching and teaching it more, but here it is today. Verse number 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. Maybe you're like me and you have these urges, these 
seemingly insatiable urges. Like, I just can't wait to eat that or drink that or see that or go there or do that or say that. You just, I want to do it. We usually do it, eventually. Well, the way you stop yourself from doing that is walking in the Spirit. Because we were just told in the Bible, you can't do what you wanted to do. Can't do. Like it's impossible. So I need to fi find out what it means to walk in the Spirit. I've got to figure it out, and we should all be asking, how in the world do I walk in the Spirit? What does it look like to walk in the Spirit? And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's rather quite simple. Number one, write it down if you're taking notes. It starts with this. It cannot start with anything else. Walking in the Spirit is seriously detesting the enemy of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is seriously detesting the enemy of the Spirit. Who's the enemy of the Spirit? Not a trick question. We just read it in verse 17. It should be obvious. Who's the enemy of the Spirit? Mm -hmm. The flesh. The flesh and the Spirit are arch rivals. They're sworn enemies. You cannot walk in the Spirit and walk in the flesh. You cannot. They are opposed to each other. They are contrary one to the other. And this is the, the foundational problem with religion. Religion tries to make human nature better. Christianity gives you an alternative to human nature. Your human nature cannot be improved. It's bad news from day one until the end of time. Now, I don't have all the answers to our complicated moral makeup, but I know this much. Within each of us this morning, there is a raging beast that the Bible refers to as the flesh. I don't know how everything came about, but I know this much. When Adam went to that tree of knowledge of good and evil, something within him was unleashed when he tasted evil. And he has passed that hunger, that appetite, that taste for evil to each of his descendants to the present day. We all share that hunger. And this is the dangerous side of humanity. Now, you should know that God gave us the tools. He designed us with tools to deal with this internal raging beast. He gave us a conscience so that we can identify its presence. He gave us his law that would tell us what is right and wrong, and he gave us, most importantly, a will to either succumb to this beast or to deny its presence or appetite. But this beast that we all have, no matter how we look this morning, no, how, no matter how we sound this morning, it wants what it wants, and it wants it when it wants it, at any cost, and it breathes heavy and hard until it gets it. This raging beast only needs a minute to get what it wants. It will take advantage of that opportunity. It will sneak in there and, you know, you open that refrigerator and it quick goes in there and grabs what it wants without seemingly us having anything to do with it. It's hasty. The flesh is relentless. It cares about no one but itself. It's most exposed when we're in pain. It's also most exposed when we're nearing starvation. Money. For some reason, fuels it. Money, it grabs it. Money is like its primary fuel. I don't know why, but it loves money. And it's universal for all of us, except how it's manifested is specific to each of us. Men and women have particular manifestations of the flesh. Depending on what ancestors, what parents we have, there are unique manifestations to each of us, but we all have it. Young and old alike, saved or lost, we all have the flesh. New believer just learning the Bible, or seasoned believer well versed in Scripture, both have this raging beast within us, and this flesh, the Bible calls it, will never be holy, will never be pure, it will never be selfless. We say, well, what's the point? Well, that's the point of this. It can be trained just a little bit. You know, I wouldn't like it unto a dog because dogs are kind of stupid and you can train them if you work very hard. I would liken the flesh to a more subtle beast, the domestic cat. I don't know if you have cats, but they're evil things. 
right? They seemingly love you until you don't give them what they want. We have a beautiful little kitty. Her name is Pepper. I call her sweet kitty, beautiful, pretty kitty. I say all the nice things I can to her to make her feel at home. But when she wants something, she wants something. You cannot reason with her. I have found that I had a dog too. When I called the dog, I'd say, Bruzy, he'd look at me. I have a cat. I say, Pepper. 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 And she just waits till I'm quiet, and then she looks back like, sup, stupid. Right? <laughs> they don't answer. They don't really do anything. But you can train them a little bit. We get her attention by saying, treat? My treat? Like, we're, we're the idiots, right? Like, we're acting like fools, and the cat just has us in her paw. That's the only time seemingly she responds. And when she wants something, she just jumps up on there. So let's say it's a blanket. She wants the blanket. She jumps up on there. It's hers. We go to take it. You know what the sweet, beautiful cat that we feed and we house, you know what she does? She goes, hmm? Do they have five or four? I don't know. But that's what she does. Like, whoa, girl, what's going on? Well, she wants what she wants, and she wants it when she wants it and doesn't care how she gets it. That's your flesh. Oh, you can give it treats. You can teach it some religious tricks. But at the end of the day, it doesn't answer to anyone but itself. That's how cats are. I was walking yesterday, my, my, my walk in the morning, and I usually don't see cats outside. I see plenty of dogs, lots of dogs. But this cat was in the front lawn. I thought, that's odd. It was a beautiful, long-haired cat. And I said, what's this cat doing in this front yard? It didn't look like a scroungely little thing. It looked like a house cat. And sure enough, I looked closely, and there was its owner on the porch, like hiding behind a door. And I'm thinking, did she train this thing to go outside to the bathroom and come in? Because it looked like the cat was doing its business, kind of. And all of a sudden I hear her say, Angel. And I'm thinking, here we go. <laughs> angel, come on, sweetheart. Come on, Angel. And I'm just walking, watching, you know. Where do you think Angel's going when she, her name is called? Not in the house. Dude, going away from the house. So what does the, the really cool house owner do with his cat? Angel, Angel. And follows the cat out and picks the cat up. Angel doesn't respond to anything. Angel doesn't care what people think. You have, to, you have to manually pick a cat up if you want it to go anywhere. Your flesh is no different. It does not respond to you. It does not answer to you. You are not its owner. It has a mind of its own, a plan of its own. It will get what it wants, when it wants, however it wants. The flesh cannot be dealt with. When it's tired, what does it do? And why can't you keep your eyes open when you're tired? Why can't you control your eyelids? They're very light because your flesh is stronger than your will. When it's hungry, it eats. You have such a hard time. I have such a hard time saying no. We give it what it wants, but let's get moral. Can we get moral? When your flesh wants to hate someone, oh, it hates someone. Stop doing that. Stop feeling that way. And this, it burns within you. Hatred comes through your veins. When it wants to be bitter at someone, it does that seemingly no matter what you tell it. When it wants to think about itself and think about how it's right all the time and everybody else is wrong and and that it's wonderful and it obsesses over itself, it does that without ever getting your permission. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, you must seriously detest The enemy of the Holy Spirit, they will not get along. Your flesh and the Spirit. They will not cohabit. They will not play nice. They will not play the piano together. They will not sing songs together. The scriptures tell us it's one or the other. You cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or or hate the one and love the other. That's just how it works. What did Paul say? Paul, who knew God, who knew himself very well, he said in Romans 7, for I know that in me, parentheses, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He said, for to will is present within me, the will to do right, but how to perform that which is good, I cannot figure it out. Now, I have to prove this. Look at verse 19. We're going to read verses 19, 20, and 21. 
And I want you to know that if you and I try to live in the flesh or do what comes natural, bad things always happen. If you put the flesh to work, Here is a short list of what can happen. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, which is excessive lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Good thing we're reading a list about everybody else. Isn't it fun to read a list about everyone but us? It's such, an, it's such an encouragement to us. Now, you and I read that. If you're a believer, you read that, and you're like, Psh, it's not me. I'm in the Spirit, right? That's what it means to be saved and born again. I'm in the Spirit. So that's not me. That's everybody bad who's not saved. And if your flesh is at work, eventually one of those or such like comes out. Now, here's what we're going to do. If you have notes, you can write this down. If you don't, don't worry about it. But I want to make it more personal. So what we're going to do is replace the problems we just read about, the products of the flesh, the works of the flesh. We're going to replace them with people. People not in here, don't worry, although I was tempted. People in the Bible. People everybody knows. People that you might think are good people so that you put a person to the problem And you see your flesh in that same passage. Adultery. That's the first work of the flesh. Uh, My mind immediately goes to one person. David. A a guy the Bible happens to call a man after God's own heart. A man who wrote uh, the majority of the Psalms in our Bible. He is a good man, you would say. He was a godly man, you might argue. And yet he was guilty of adultery, which means his flesh did that with Bathsheba. He's in the list of great men and women in Hebrews chapter 11. Then we got fornication, and there are a lot of options to choose from, but my mind went immediately to Samson. Samson committed fornication with Delilah. You say, well, Samson wasn't a great man. He wasn't a godly man. He was a carnal man. He did bad things. Well, whoever wrote Hebrews 11 didn't see it that way because he put him in the, the hall of faith. Uncleanness. Well, that's everybody but us, right? Obviously. But I know a guy who walked with Jesus for three years. I know a guy who walked with Jesus for three years. He was so important to Jesus' mission that that the Lord called him the leader of the pack and said to him that Satan desires to sift you as we, but when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. This is a man who said to Jesus, I'll never leave thee. And the Lord said, "Uh, actually, you're going to deny me three times. And this man, when he watched his Lord being taken away and he watched his Lord go into the palace where he would be interrogated, he surrounded himself with worldly people and these worldly people said to Peter, hey, you're one of, the, you're one of those Christians. And this man said, I am not. Oh, buddy, you just lied. Your lips were unclean. He was asked again, he said, I am not. He was asked a third time and Peter let out a string of sailor cuss words and said, I am not. His lips were unclean. Because his flesh was in control. Lasciviousness, that's none of us. Maybe not. Excessive lust. But the first century church in Corinth had some real excessive sexual sins taking place. And if you think the church of Christ today is exempt from that, you're a fool. The way our culture is going, we will see this in our churches in no time. When the flesh has free reign, it will do what it wants. Idolatry, (laughs) that's none of us. We worship the true God, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone. Well, amen. But I know a guy who got wisdom from heaven, I mean from heaven, who decided to marry a thousand women, who eventually turned his heart from the one true God to a multitude of gods, and his sins weren't private, they were public. He built groves to his false gods. His name's Solomon. Now, surely none of us here are witches. Surely none of us would ever be witches. But I will tell you this, if you go to a witch for any advice, if you go to a witch for any counsel because you're so desperate for answers, so desperate for healing, then it's no different than being a witch. And that's exactly what the man that God, the man who God chose to lead the kingdom did. 
Well, our culture doesn't have witches. We don't see anybody flying around on brooms with, with funny pointed black hats, but they're all over the place. They're all over the place. They're usually in the area of medicine. That's why they're called witch doctors. So yeah, we do that. Sure we do. Hatred. Not me, Pastor K. I don't hate anybody. Um, maybe not now. But the Bible tells us ten men. Ten men who were adults, who were the sons of a patriarch, the grandsons of, of a patriarch, and the great-grandsons of the patriarch, Abraham. They hated their brother. Why did they hate Joseph? Why did they hate Joseph? Joseph was what? The favored son of his father. That's what he did wrong. That's how quick you and I can turn on people. Let's talk about variance. What is variance? Well, if you know anything about town rules, if you want to build something in a particular area that isn't properly zoned for it or there's just not the right room for it, you have to go to the town and get a variance. That basically is an exception to the rule. Your neighbors have to sign off on it. The town has to sign off on it, but it's an exception to the rule. So variance is making an exception to the rule, but in this case, it's an unjust exception to the rule. So basically it means if you say to your wife or your husband, I'm okay with this, go ahead and do it, your spouse does it, and they come back and tell you they did it, and you say, why did you do that? I told you you shouldn't do that. That's variance. You're varying and you're causing dissension by flip-flopping or changing what you said. We definitely do this. And I know a prominent woman in Scripture who did this. Her name is Sarah. She said, go take Hagar, have a baby for us. So Abraham says, okay. Has a baby? And Sarah said, essentially, what'd you do that for? You pig. And then she gave him a hard time having this son and raising that son and made his life very difficult, no doubt. Emulations. What are emulations? It's when you try to emulate somebody. So emulating somebody is not a bad thing unless you're trying to emulate them to be better than them, competing with them, to be more spiritual or more prominent, whatever it may be. And we do this. I know a guy in the Bible who did it. He was a really important man in the Bible. His name would eventually be, be called the name that we use all the time today now in our Bibles. It's Israel. Didn't Jacob want to be like his older brother? That's why he stole his birthright and his blessing. Wrath. Wrath, I'm not an angry guy. Preachers don't get angry. Jonah did. Why did Jonah get angry? Because God saved the Ninevites. And the Bible said he was very, very angry with God. Strife. Baptists cannot walk away from this one. Who can I put for strife? What name can I associate with strife so that I would realize this is personal? This, is, this could be me as much as anybody else. Our hero, Paul the Apostle. The contention, the Bible says, was so sharp between him and Barnabas that they departed. They were not friends anymore. Seditions. Seditions, where you want to overthrow the, the authority above you, your employer, your government, uh, maybe it's your, your father, or your mother, maybe it's your husband, uh, whoever has authority over you, you just want to get rid of that authority, and I know that's not us Americans, we not, we're not like that, I know it's not us Baptists, we're not like that, although we're very much like that, and so is Judas Iscariot. Oh, good, I can't relate to Judas, I would never betray Jesus. He spent three years with Christ doing miracles, he was trusted with money. This man was a good man who let his flesh take over and it did what it does. Heresies, heresies. Heresies is teaching anything that's not true. I'm gonna give you a name that, again, you're gonna say, oh good, it's not me, Balaam. If you know the story of Balaam, Balaam was asked by the king of the Moabites to curse the nation of Israel and three times he did not do that. He blessed the nation of Israel. Three times he spoke truthfully. Three times he felt the Spirit of God leading him. He saw visions. He gave prophecies. This man heard directly from God. And yet we read in Revelation that he taught the doctrines that eventually ended the Jewish nation's success in the wilderness there. So you and I could be the same. Envyings. Envyings. 
I have a good name for you. He wrote 12 Psalms. In one of them, he said, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. His name is Asaph. Yeah. Our flesh can do that too. Murders. Unless you think Moses was a bad guy. Drunkenness. Unless you have communion here at church and I get the wrong box. <laughs> Noah was a pretty good guy, right? And then we've got revelings. What are revelings? Feasting with silliness. Which basically is what our weddings look like. Right? The reception? Silly dancing, silly drinking, just obnoxious activity. Who in the Bible do I find guilty of reveling? It'll surprise you, he's at the, he's at the foot of Mount Sinai. His uh, younger brother is up on the mountain. He's been there for 40 days getting the law from God. He has his young student, Joshua, with him. This man decides to get everybody's earrings and make a golden calf where the Bible says they would dance and play and feast. This is reveling. His name is Aaron. He's the high priest. And then we finish with such like. Fill in the blank, my friends. <laughs> if you didn't see your tendency, if you didn't see your nature in that list, if you can't relate with any of these guys, that such like is for you, whatever it may be. Why, do I, why am I spending so much time on this? It's intentional because if you think there's any good in your flesh, you'll never walk in the Spirit. I've only been in ministry for 17 years, but I can tell you that the list behind me, the 17 sins that are mentioned, I have dealt with somebody at some point about each of them in this church, the best people in the world. This is the power of the flesh. It's a raging beast inside of us that goes where it wants to go and does what it wants to do, and we must detest the enemy of the Spirit. Younger Christians today, you're in grave danger. Younger Christians today are being taught by your society to trust yourself, to believe in yourself, to follow your dreams, to, to be one with yourself. It is the worst advice you can receive. It is the absolute opposite of what you need to do. Do not trust yourself. Do not believe in yourself. Do not see in you any good because there isn't any. And this is why young Christians are quitting by the droves. They're sick of trying to do right and failing and saying, what's wrong with me? They're sick of coming to church and supposedly reading their Bible and singing hymns, although feeling hypocritical because at home they're watching pornography or they're listening to bad music or they're hanging out with wrong people. They feel hip hypocritical and they just say, I can't do it anymore. It's because you've never been told there's nothing good in you. Your flesh can't be trusted. It's not good. It's bad news. I have a few fears. One of my fears is aging to the point where I'm in a nursing home and I've lost control of my mind. It's a great fear of mine. Not because I know, I'll know what happens. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what my family will think of me. Now, why do I say that? I've watched enough people now that I'm convinced and I've watched enough older people now that I'm convinced that we are who we are and we only become more of who we are the longer we live. The frightening thing about aging is you lose more and more control over who you are. You lose control over things like your bladder. You lose control over your eyes. You lose control over your ears. Eventually, you lose control over your hands and your feet. You lose control over your mind. And what naturally comes out of your mouth, what naturally comes out of your life is who you are. That's frightening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I know somebody who told me that they have a, a loved one who's in a nursing home and they've aged quite, quite well, we'll say older, but they never cursed, they never swore. And now they curse like a sailor. You say, well, what's that all about? Well, that's what their mind thinks. They just lost control at some point of their mouth. I've gone to nursing homes where I've dealt with people, old men who want me to marry them and the nurse. Ladies and gentlemen, 
That's where the mind of a man goes, even at age 70. But he had such a disease, he couldn't control his mind. But what he felt, what he thought, naturally still came out. You know who I don't want anyone to know what's in here? Is my wife and my kids. I don't want them coming to the nursing home and I can't control what I'm saying. I'm just saying all these awful things about everybody. You know, Ray Madeline, what I wanted to say about him all those years, let me tell you now. And, and then it just gets out there, you know? Ryan comes and visits me and I, let me tell you how I really feel about you all these years. You know, I, that's what I'm terrified of. Right now I can keep it all in. I can control what I say, what I do. There's coming a day I might not have that control and terrifies me. There's a beast inside of me that's awful. It's wretched. It's dark. It's pitiful. Don't fool yourself. You have the same beast. You have the same beast. It cannot be trusted. I can't leave you with that. That is not an encouraging message, so we're going to have to finish this. Because it gets good. I mean, it gets good, but it's Quaker. I just want to spend all the time on that. I'm just so sick in our culture of everyone saying we're good. We're not. Let me just put it out there. Christianity is not supposed to make you better. There's no hope in you. How about that for a message? Christianity is to give you something different. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. You just don't get rid of the old one till death. So you're living with two. And they are contrary one to the other. Verse number 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Write down number two. It might sound overly simple, but it's the truth. Walking in the Spirit is simply following the leadership of the Spirit. Now, it's not profound at first, but hang on. Walking in the Spirit is simply following the leadership of the Spirit. But if ye be led of the Spirit. It's so important that we see the practicality of walking in the Spirit and the possibility of walking in the Spirit. Because we get this idea that walking in the Spirit is some spooky thing that we hope one day we'll attain. And maybe God will, will help me to walk in the Spirit. I'll pray for it. And no, 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 no. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm not convinced, and we'll talk about it, I think, next week, but I'm not convinced that walking in the Spirit is the same as being filled with the Spirit. So we'll talk about that next week. But today we're talking about walking in the Spirit, which is crucial to not uh, fulfilling the lust of the flesh. But you'll never follow the leadership of the Spirit if you think you can handle it in the flesh. So here's why I've spent so much time saying you're bad, rotten, and a scoundrel. Because if you've lived any time in the flesh, you wake up in the morning and say, Duh, not you again! I know you're desperately wicked. I know you're deceitful above all things. Dreaded you. You immediately look up for help, not within for help. You say, God, I can't trust myself. God, I can't be alone with myself. God, I screw everything up. I say the wrong words. I think the wrong thoughts. I do the wrong deeds. God, I can't do it. It's got to be you. Now you are on the path to walking in the Spirit. Because the Spirit will not lead you if you do not want his leadership. But if you want his leadership, then he will lead you, and you simply need to follow him. If you're following him, ladies and gentlemen, you are walking in the Spirit. But pastor, how do I know where the Spirit is leading me? How do I know what the Spirit is leading me to do? How do I know what the Spirit is leading me to say? I can't hear him. I can't see him. There aren't any emails or texts sent from him to me. How do I know? Well, this is what's so awesome about it. The answer is right in the scriptures. We just read verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary one to the other. So in any, let's, let's talk about uh, you waking up in the morning tomorrow morning. No, let's talk about you getting in the car on the way home from church. You're gonna get in the car. If you're married, your spouse is gonna say something to you. It might be something like, can you believe how long he went today? It might be something like, what you got in the oven, babe? I mean, I don't know. It could, be, it could be anything from nice things to bad things. But when you are told something you don't like, 
if you want to know how the Spirit's leading you, identify how the flesh is leading you because they are contrary one to the other. So let's just say Jeremiah, thank you for being an example today, Jeremiah, says to Aubrey on the way home, what you got in the oven, babe? And her flesh says internally now, boy, how about you make lunch runs? Not that she would ever do that. <laughs> but if that's what her flesh is saying, because it's not going to say, I love you so much, I would make the f- all, all meals for you the rest of your life with a smile on my face and no appreciation. That's not what her flesh says. Remember, her flesh is a dreaded beast. It's a dreaded beast. As sweet as Aubrey is, it's a dreaded beast. And instinctually, her heart says, her flesh says, make it yourself. So now you know what the Spirit says, because they're contrary. If the flesh says, make it yourself, the Spirit says, I'd love to make lunch for you. They're contrary. Are you following me? It's too close to home for Aubrey. I'm sorry, Aubrey. All right. <laughs> let's say you go to work tomorrow. Hank's retired. So let's say, Hank, you go back to work for the Moganites, all right? And they say, Hank, get to work. Your flesh says, you get to work. Right? right? Yeah. Now you know what the Spirit is leading, because they're contrary one to the other. The Spirit says, I'll be glad to do that. You don't need Bible and verse to know what the Spirit is leading. You just need to know what the flesh is telling you to do. They're exactly opposite. You sit down for for dinner at the restaurant, and and the waiter's a little rude to you, and and internally you're just like, I want to tell her off. Yes, your flesh wants to do that. Don't sit there like you're not like me. Your flesh wants to tell people, stop, treat me like that. So the Spirit says, it's good to see you. I hope you're having a nice day. We're so glad to be here. Contrary one to the other. You just have to know you, and then you'll know him. Now, if you're sitting there and deceiving yourself and thinking, boy, I'm, pastor's a really awful person. I never think those thoughts. I never have those urges. You're either a, an inanimate object or you're lying. Because we're all that, we are all that way. You may have just learned to offer your little kitty some treats to get you to say what you want, what you're supposed to say. But deep down inside, mm-mm. Natural instincts, natural tendencies are always dark. They're always evil. They always lead to something bad. The Spirit offers a supernatural tendency, a supernatural instinct that is always, always good. I want to put this up here real quick just to give you an image, and we're almost done. One quick point after that. Um, Sometimes we get this idea that uh, walking the flesh and walking the Spirit, we can do that together simultaneously. You cannot. It's either one or the other. In the middle of of that decision to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh is your will. You have three powers inside of you, three powerful things inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit, he's very powerful. You have the flesh, it is very, very powerful. And then you have the will, which seems weak. But it has the power to unleash the dangers of the flesh or the beauty of the spirit. And so the will determines which direction you're going, up to walk in light or down to walk in darkness, up to get all the good things that come from the Spirit or down to get all the bad things that come from the flesh. Every day and every hour of every day, you and I have the equal opportunity to walk in the Spirit or walk in the flesh. And it can be second by second, minute by minute. You get up in the morning and immediately you have the chance to walk in the Spirit And maybe somebody says something to you that you don't like and you walk in the flesh, but you have the chance to get out of the flesh and walk in the spirit, but you can't do both. And if you take just today, just after church, take today through the rest of the day and evaluate, am I walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit? It'll change your mind. It'll change your life. It'll change your perspective on Christianity. You can't do both. You can't. You're either in one or the other. You might be in a big place of decision, When you're sleeping, you have no will over what's being thought, what's being done in your sleeps, but as soon as you wake up, it's your decision. Am I in the spirit or in the flesh? It's your decision. It's your decision. So if you're gossiping, you're in the flesh, period. You're walking in the flesh. There's no way around that. Yeah, but I'm saying saying important things to somebody else. No, no, no. You're walking in the flesh. 
If the Holy Spirit convicts you and says you shouldn't be doing that, you have a chance now to walk in the Spirit, to go back to that person and say, I'm apologizing for talking about that person the way I did. Please forgive me. I won't do that again. You're in the Spirit. If you want, you can walk away and go tell somebody else something you shouldn't say. You're walking in the flesh again. It's just back and forth. But if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You cannot gossip when you're walking in the Spirit, period. You cannot hate your wife walking in the Spirit. You cannot look at pornography and lust when you're walking in the Spirit. You cannot go gambling when you're walking in the Spirit. You cannot lie when you're walking in the Spirit. It's impossible. It's exciting. Verse number 22, let's get you out of here. Verse number 22, very quickly, please. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Remember what the fulfillment of the law is? We're by love, serve one another. It's the first fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's no law against any of these things. Verse 24, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit... And that is in contrast to being dead in trespasses and sins. If we live in the Spirit, believers, let us also walk in the Spirit. It is our choice. It is our decision. Not something God gives us. We choose it. So number three, walking in the Spirit is not only seriously detesting the enemy of the Spirit. It is not only simply following the leadership of the Spirit. But number three, it is sincerely welcoming the fruit of the Spirit. This is where the spiritual rubber meets the road within Christianity. If you want to be a successful Christian, it isn't becoming an extraordinary Christian. It's becoming a spirit-soaked Christian. A successful Christian is nothing more than a fertile field from which the, the fruits of the Spirit grow. If you're a loving person, if you're a good person, if you're a faithful person, if you're a a gentle person, all the fruits of the Spirit here, if you're all those things, it's not because of you. It's because of the Spirit. We try to resist sin and be good. It's an effort in futility. If you walk in the Spirit, you cannot do wrong, and you will have the fruits of the Spirit. So the key is walking in the Spirit. How do I do that? Well, seriously detesting the enemy of the Spirit and simply following the leadership of the Spirit. Now, I don't want to leave you without mentioning what I think is is a frightening reality. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, you have to truly and sincerely and fully embrace the alternative to the flesh. Um, let's make it more specific. If you are bitter with somebody because they hurt you and they hurt you really bad even, if you walk in the Spirit, you will have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, all this good stuff, and you'll forgive that person, period. You cannot be bitter if you're walking in the Spirit. That's what's awesome. I've been counseling long enough, long enough now to know that when people come to me and say, hey, I don't want to be this way anymore. I don't want to feel this way about that person anymore. I believe them, but I also don't deny the fact that their flesh isn't going to make it easy to walk in the Spirit. Because we really don't want to forgive people. The Spirit does. But the dreaded beast within us? This may sound insensitive, perhaps, to some of you if you have an issue with a brother or sister or family member or, 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 or past offender. This may even sound insensitive to you if, if you're struggling with particular sins, but I believe so strongly in the Word of God that if we walk in the Spirit, forgiving some, someone is easy. I believe so strongly in the word of God that if we walk in the spirit, saying no to sin is easy. I believe that because when you walk in the spirit, you cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. The reality is we don't want to forgive people. And in many cases, we don't want to say no to that sin. 
I learned a long time ago with my own personal sins and struggles that I really didn't want to have victory. Oh, it grieved me, but I really didn't want to because I like sin. And if you're going to walk in the Spirit, you have to embrace the absence of that sin. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, you have to embrace the absence of that issue, that vice, that, that, that work of the flesh, that product of the flesh. And that's hard for us. It's really, really hard for us. You say, I just can't deal with it. Well, that's the problem. You're trying to deal with it. The Spirit offers to do it for you. But if, if I give him the keys to the car, is he going to take that from me? Well, yeah, that's what you wanted. Actually, no, we don't really want that because we love it. Sustained virtue, sustained love, sustained gentleness, sustained peace, you name it, is only the result of walking in the Spirit. Dealing with a difficult spouse over, over weeks, months, years, you can't do it in the flesh, period. It's only the result of walking in the Spirit. Ask yourself this morning, you know you, you know your flesh, you know your struggles, you know your issues. Do you really want the Spirit of God to make it easy for you to love that person? Do you really want the Spirit of God to make it easy for you to forgive that guy? Do you really want the Spirit of God to make it easy for you to say no to that pleasure? If you don't, you'll never walk in the Spirit. But if you do, you cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh over here. You can't. It's awesome. Let's stand. Let's stand. You've been so attentive. I appreciate your patience. I know it's been a long hour. Maybe go back and listen to this another time, but this could change your life. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're not a Christian, this is foreign to you. And I'd urge you to become a Christian. If you are a Christian, are you walking in the Spirit right this moment? I mean right now. I mean right this second. Are your thoughts the Spirit's thoughts or are they the flesh's thoughts? Will you be walking in the Spirit five minutes from now? Will you be walking in the Spirit on the way home from church 20 minutes from now? If not, then you're walking in the flesh. It's never both.